London news agents. It'd be very nice to meet you one day, Mr Jimmy Savile, just, well, you know... if you've got a sister, you could meet me by bringing her along. I, I mean, I haven't got any sisters, I but... I don't usually meet fellas, but if you've got a sister, that's OK. I've got a personal assistant called... And part of her job description is that anyone I demand she um, greets, meets, massages, she has to do it. She's very attractive, Jimmy. Well, that's, that's, that's a good start. R- what a kind good of... start. You could send her along to do some research. Would you like her to wear anything in, in particular, Sir Jimmy? <laughs> I'd actually prefer her to wear nothing. Right, so you want... My assistant to meet you naked. Okay, well that's that's not going to be that's not going to be a problem. That was Jimmy Savile speaking to Russell Brand in 2007, and that is the archive for the ages, isn't it? One prolific dead paedophile joking about grooming with a man who this past weekend has been accused of rape and sexual assault live on Radio Two, live on the most listened to radio station in the country. This wasn't. 1977 or 1987 it was 2007 something that a period that we wouldn't consider to be so long ago or so different from our own time and yet if anything is becoming clear from the brand story is that it was to some extent and on today's show we're going to be talking about the brand investigation from the sunday times the times channel four how they got to the point of being finally able to publish after four years the reaction to the story and what happens to Brand now. Welcome to the News Agents. It's Emily. It's Lewis. And it's worth saying that Russell Brand denies strenuously all the allegations that we are going to be talking about in today's episode. A little bit later, we'll be talking about Liz Truss, who's made her comeback speech, and she strenuously denies any sense of responsibility for what happened on her watch almost a year ago. Well, we're going to start with the Brand story. Uh, extraordinary weekend, uh, the Sunday Times, the Times and Channel 4 all publishing their allegations about brand in different forms. There was the Dispatches documentary on Saturday, the series of stories that followed uh, in the two Times newspapers and all of them centering on four women, although they, say, although they do say they've spoken to others as well. Four women who are, to a greater or lesser extent, anonymous and who have made allegations about Brand that range from rape to sexual impropriety to grooming. And one of the extraordinary things about, particularly the documentary on uh, Channel 4 on Saturday, was some of the archive that was used and used to illustrate part of the story where Brand makes jokes and suggestions and talks about the sort of things that he would like to do sexually. And obviously, we kind of knew this story was coming on, on the Friday. There were all these rumours about it. Um, and Brand put his video out. He tried to scoop them all, effectively, uh, spike their story, uh, denied all the allegations, talked about you know this being a mainstream media conspiracy and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what amazed me, Emily, about it was, obviously, the content of the stories were, was shocking. Um, what amazed me was the reaction. The reaction so quickly from some people who, frankly, you know, I mean, they've got TV programs. They are themselves so-called mainstream figures, basically dismissing the story and coming to Brand's defence before they'd even seen the documentary or really read any of the allegations. Yeah, and we should just, for those of you who haven't seen it or who've kind of been in the hole for the last couple of days, we should say that there are allegations of rape in this documentary and in the investigation by the Sunday Times and Times. There is allegations of sexual assault. And there is also what you might call grooming behaviour. And for me, this is where I think the whole question becomes quite complicated because you can see where a criminal prosecution would go. You could see where people might want to follow up in terms of, you know, finding charges to press. But then there's this whole grey area, which is the stuff that he talks about on stage, the stuff where he, you know, for want of a better phrase, just sounds like a dick and quite an aggressive, narcissistic dick. But it is not illegal behaviour. And he talks, you know, right at the beginning about blowjobs and he talks about making women gag. And and, and the investigation also talks about a 16 year old who who was made to leave her school lessons to come to his house. And actually in the doc, the woman who, you know, they call Alice, raises the question 
of why is this legal? You know, why is it legal for a 16 year old to be having a relationship with a 30 year old? And should the whole age of consent change? And I think it raises a lot of questions about, you know, these shadowy figures who we all know have been behaving appallingly because they've told us they've behaved appallingly and they've spoken about, you know, in inverted commas, sex addiction. And yet the law wouldn't stop most of what Russell Brand was actually doing. That's well, sort of an extraordinary place to be. Yeah, and Alice, who has been speaking to the BBC today, has said that you know Brand's response to her allegations are insulting. She says that the idea that this is a mainstream media conspiracy is laughable. She's also said that a BBC chauffeur-driven car was used to pick her up from school and take her to Brand's house, as always with any of these stories, everything seems to inexorably always come back in some way to, to the BBC or there's a BBC sort of element to it. And there are like real questions here, both at Channel 4, BBC and elsewhere, other media executives about they're kind of knowing about elements of brand behaviour mm. and perhaps not the most extreme versions of it. But, you know, as the documentary said in Channel 4, when he was doing Big Brother, you know, producers going to talk to young women and asking them to go and meet him uh, back in his, you know, after the show and so on. Um, so there is this in plain sight idea and that's what the the documentary um, is called but i mean i suppose the thing is is that you know so many people have interviewed him you've interviewed him what were your what were your what were your impressions of him i interviewed him when he just brought out this book about addiction i think it was called recovery you know and to be fair i i went to that interview preparing to loathe him um and he kept me waiting and I'm a really rigorous so when time was this? Is like 2017? 2017, 2018, yeah. end of 2017. And I remember him being late and I remember having his own makeup room and sort of thinking, oh my God, you know, what a narcissist. I hate people who do the power play thing by, you know, making it a, a sort of an interview wait for no sort of apparent reason. And then in truth, you know, he walks into the room and he is mesmerising. You know, he's funny, he's smart, he's linguistic, his his language is, is magnetic and, and he's charismatic. He charmed you. He did to some extent. I mean, I still found myself taking out this idea of, you know, oh, you're a victim of addiction, you're a victim of, of sex. You know, anyone who sleeps with 100 women a day, sleeps with, you know, has sex with 100 women or whatever, can choose not to. Right. So let's just get past the idea that that is some some terrible malady and illness. Of course, he wasn't addicted. It's it's behavior that you can change. But in the context of the interview, I'd be lying if I said, you know, of course, there isn't something about him. We know that there's something about him because he sells out shows. He reinvents himself. I mean, curious that that just when this investigation was starting, he managed this whole kind of of personal reinvention towards, you know, wellness. And and wellness should kind of ring a lot of alarm bells in this day and age because it tends to mean conspiracy, anti-vax. Was he getting ready, you know, to sort of, if you like, almost groom his audiences into thinking everything against him was a conspiracy? Was, was that why he was finding these new alternative audiences? Let's listen to a bit of your interview. When you look back at that promiscuous lifestyle, do you think, does that appear? Call you? Do you think, God, I was disgusting? Do you look at your daughter now and think, I hope she never meets Emily, Russell Brown when she grows up? Don't get so up. worked up about it. It's only a, a rhetorical device. Does it appall you? No, my dear. I don't look back at the past and get all worked up about it like Ebenezer Scrooge. I simply think those are some things I've done. I've amended for them. And as for the likelihood of some sort of... Uh, Faustian kick up the arse from future Russell. If my daughter meets somebody who's caring and sensitive and knows how to communicate, then I think that will be a good thing. He sort of swatted me down like a fly there. You well, know, he, he sounded to me like you touched a nerve, actually. When I, he, particularly when you watch it, when I because I yeah. watched it yesterday, I just thought actually for the first time he looks a bit irritated and that you had touched a nerve. But what do you get back? You get kind of. Goethe, Dickens, you know, these extraordinary erudite references. And what he tried to do after that bit was get it onto the I'm a great dad, let me tell you some dad stories. And this was really weird, actually, because he's sort of telling me about his his newborn and what it's like being a dad. And then he accuses me of tuning out. He says, you're editing this as I'm speaking, which was quite a quite perceptive, yeah, quite astute, quite perceptive. And I thought, yeah, 
I said, yes, you're right, I am, because I didn't buy it, you know. I'd been trying to talk to him about his behaviour and his past behaviour, and he was already kind of trying to sell himself, rebrand, ha-ha, himself, as this sort of cute, loving dad. And there are some things that, as an interviewer, just kind of like, you just don't stick. You sort of get rid of it altogether. But, but, you know, if you take that interview as a whole, yeah, he kind of, he was out to charm. And I think that's what he did over and over again, which is why... You know, we had him on Newsnight. That was a Newsnight interview. He was hired by BBC. He was hired by. Well, it was a period Channel he 4. became a sort of political savant, right? Like completely, he, he, he was you know, voted one of the most intellectual minds by Prospect Magazine. You yeah. know, it's sort of Ed Miliband interviewed him, and right. All this stuff, right? There was that period in the mid, you know, 2015, 2016. He was everywhere. He was everywhere, and that's how it works. And that's despite the fact, obviously, he'd had to leave the BBC in the late 2000s over the Saxgate stuff. Um, I mean, we started the show with that, what I find is like jaw-dropping interview mm, mm. exchange between mm. him and Savile. Mm. Um, and one of the problems, I suppose, when these sort of stories come out is that everything sometimes gets compared to Savile because Savile was just the most horrendous case probably in well, modern British history. Um, but it, But it is amazing that they have that conversation and that that goes out on radio too. And I don't know what it says. I don't know... To be honest, does it say something about the power of celebrity and charisma, which yeah. to some extent they clearly, or to a large extent they both had? Does it say something about shifting culture? Can it have shifted that much since 2007? Or does it just say something about us and the fact that actually, you know, what, this weekend, 2,000 people were still at his gig, despite the fact laughing that they along. knew what was coming, laughing along yeah. and giving him a standing ovation. Also, the Savile thing is really interesting because it speaks a little bit to how investigations of the kind that we're going to be talking about work. And I remember at the time, I was at Newsnight, and I heard a conversation between executives saying, well, have we got enough evidence on the Savile stuff? You know, I think he's only sort of, you know touched a few women's breasts, right? And that was how it was seen at the time. Like, can we really go with this? Is it strong enough? And to be fair, as a journalist, you are looking, you know, you have to have a high bar. You have to know that the stuff you're... The highest on something like this. Really high, because he was he was this, you know, hugely popular, again, charismatic, family fun figure at the time, right? And so this idea that you'd be weighing up, were his crimes bad enough? That was essentially what you were doing. Were those crimes bad enough and have we got the evidence to show for them? If we had known then how many more people would come out and tell us things, how you know, I'm, I'm going to pay tribute to Liz McKean and, and Myron Jones who were leading this investigation, who never got to put it on air. But if we had trusted them in the way clearly that the Sunday Times editor has trusted its journalists to say, I know that what you're doing is touching a nerve of many, many more stories. These cases are all watertight, but there will be many, many others. The whole thing would have been very differently told, I think. And this is what, to go back to that question about the reaction, what, again, I found amazing about it. Maybe I shouldn't have found it amazing, but but I did. This is what really wound me up about it, mm. which is to say that, you know, OK, you 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 know, you know Brand's got a huge following. Like you say, Emily, it's a really interesting turn that he just suddenly decided to make in 2018, 2019, where he starts, correct, you know, attacking the mainstream media and who knows what he knew about what was coming. Um, but, you know, you've got actually like genuinely kind of vaguely credible people or people within the mainstream media, you know, saying things like, well, why don't they just why didn't they go to the police, these women? Or why have they all come forward at the same time? It's like, hello, do you know anything at all about doing a story or working on a story? And by the way, maybe some of them do, but nonetheless, they just want to have an opinion. Indeed, they just why, want to have something to say. Why women do or don't go to the police? Well, quite so. You know what? And I think we, in the quotes, mainstream media, I think we will have to be extremely robust about this in sort of shooting this down and not sort of playing into it in the sense that, you know, what you've got here is a meticulously researched story that has got all sorts of accompanying evidence in all sorts of different ways. It's been worked on for four years. Yes, Brand denies it, and it is important to make that clear at every turn. But nonetheless, you know, is it any surprise at all that women don't come forward when they are so comprehensively disbelieved mm. by mainstream quote unquote media figures before, by the way, many of them had even seen the documentary or even read anything that was in those newspapers. I found it astonishing I, just how quickly this became a sort of culture war cleavage. And by the way, I don't believe for a moment that they didn't 
believe the story. I just don't believe well, yeah, that. You're right. But I will just quote Naomi Klein here, who's a guest that actually we're going to be speaking to um, in the next couple of weeks. And her line is this, conspiracists groom their followers to believe any attack on their hero is a conspiracy to take them down. It's a closed mental loop. And I think once you put that in context, you realise that, you know, possibly Russell Brand has found his kind of conspiracy nut jobs who are happy to go with him. So that if a story like this breaks, they're already on side. They've bought into him. They've got the happy juice. They don't have to question what journalists are saying. They don't have to question what many of their own papers are saying. It's Trump. You've already dismissed the institution, whether it's the rule of law or the Department of Justice or the mainstream media or the civil service, whatever it is, you've already dismissed them so that you're ready to go and say, clearly, they're just out to get me. And, and by the way, what is so utterly disgusting about some of that stuff? And again, you know, you, you can just read the report and, and watch a documentary and make up your own mind about it. You don't need us to tell you. But when you look at the way... When, but you've got so many of those same people, those same people who told us, do you remember the BBC was a den of perverts? Because of the Hugh Edwards story, a story which, again, whatever you think about it, in terms of the evidential basis and what we're talking about and the allegations here, we're talking about something of a potentially quite different order of magnitude. So, you know what? Like, it is time with regards to these stories that people just left, stop treating them as a means of prosecuting, A, either the culture war or B, an attempt to sort of peddle your absurd kind of constant, you know, conspiracy fueled narrative but I think and just is... treated them as for what they are. Otherwise, we'll never progress or go any further. Yeah, I, I think it is all part of the democratisation of media, though. And by that, I mean that just like the interviewer doesn't necessarily hold all the cards here. We saw that in the interviews with Elon Musk or with Andrew Tate, where Someone they can else turn the tables. In behind, Absolutely. Way, Elon, Both of, of them, I think, did. Yeah. But don't forget Russell Brand has his own following on YouTube, where he took on Friday night straight away when these allegations were about to drop to talk to six and a half million followers, right? And so that is your cult. That is your ready-made audience who you are trying to get on side to preempt anything that may come out afterwards. Yeah, but I mean, you know, absolutely, which is why so-called mainstream uh, organisations really ought to be more careful. So, you know, you have like someone like Bev Turner, who is a presenter on GB News, tweeting out, you're being attacked at Rusty Rockets, i.e. Russell Brand, and establishment media don't know what to do with the fact you have 6 million subscribers and generate autonomous knowing and original content. You're welcome on my GB News show anytime. You're a hit... Keep going. This proves you're winning. You're a hero. And that is before she'd read any of it. And indeed, actually, to her fellow GB News presenter, Andrew Pierce's credit... On GB News this morning, there was this astounding exchange between the two of them because they just happened to host a show together on GB News mid-morning show. This is a little exchange that they had. And you say you're a hero. Don't you think before you say someone's a hero... Hang on. Don't you think before you say he's a hero, you should establish whether these very serious allegations are true? Well, before... Well, what's the answer to that? Before I tweeted that... I had spoken to several sources, mm. close to Brand, right. close to the Times. Had you spoken close to those to four women? I was confident that there is no smoking gun in this regard. Right. I remain confident, having watched the dispatches, if that is what they've got after four years of a joint investigation by the Times newspaper and Channel 4, those four flimsy allegations from women who choose to stay anonymous so there is nobody that can counter their version of events. It's nobody who can say, well, hang on, I was there on that occasion. I was reminded, funnily enough, of the last time we covered this sort of story was with the FT investigation to Chris Binodi. And the fund manager in the city. The, the hedge fund manager who is accused of rather similar things to Russell Brand. And a friend of mine said, oh, I remember you saying at the time, this is what happens when you have you know, more women in editorial positions. And actually, if you look across now, and it's by no means only women, but you have Rula Khalif at the FT, you have Becky Barrow on the Sunday Times news editor desk, you have Louisa Compton at Dispatches, I would even say Esme Wren, Jess Brammer uh, at Newsnight, just somehow made these kinds of stories their priorities. And they didn't feel small 
And I think that's really important that women have to feel that actually they might take something that doesn't look like very much at first glance. But most women would realise that if that's happened once, it's probably happened a hundred times. And if it's happened there, it's probably happened in other places. And it, it, I, I just feel that actually what you're seeing now is what happens when you just get a more balanced, gender balanced editorial take on these stories. They become more important. Well, in just a moment, we're going to be speaking to uh, one of those exact women and indeed one of the women at the heart of this story, Rosamond Irwin, the media editor, media editor at the Sunday Times, who, as I say, was one of those who wrote the story this weekend. Stay with us. Well, not welcome back. And joining us now, as promised, is the media editor of the Sunday Times, Ros Irwin, who, Ros, started this investigation in 2019. I mean, started four years ago. Maybe we should start there and just explain to our listeners why something like this can take so long. Yes, I first started working on this in 2019. And the reason these things take so long is because when you approach people, you very, very rarely find someone who really desperately wants to tell their story if it is the worst thing that that has happened to them and that's what they're alleging um and obviously that there is a lot of people for whom what they're alleging is the worst thing that has happened to them and you have to you have to be so careful to corroborate evidence and then the challenge is obviously finding more people because it's very very hard to do it on your own to be the woman who speaks out on your own and i know some people have done that uh, and they're very very brave and i uh, i commend them for that but i think it's very very difficult and legally unless they have exceptionally strong evidence it's almost impossible to do it on your own. You are trying to encourage more women to come forward, presumably. So you might hear a story, I'm guessing, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound criminal, but you think might lead to something else, right? I mean, is this how you're sort of putting jigsawing things together? Yeah, so obviously not every experience that is uh, that is it that it's in the public interest to report actually not everything has to be criminal for it to be in the public interest to report it um and you know there is always this question mark particularly i think around me two stories of you know does does a bad date story a, a really really bad date story but that where nothing's actually happened that you could sort of call criminal but it has been so uncomfortable and so unpleasant that it is something that that, that person is really affected by and really remembers you know is that in the public interest to report it? Well, it, it may well be, yes. And there were stories like that that we that we that we came across and, and obviously we put those allegations as well. But in the end we've we've really focused on the four strongest stories where uh, people are women are making allegations of sexual assault. When did you how did you first become interested in the story? What was the genesis of it? So it became known to me that there were a lot of comedians mentioning in their sets that um, the, these allegations. So they were saying things that I can't actually say, uh, but you can get away with in a stand-up gig where they were accusing, in very blunt terms, Russell Brand of, of sexual offences. And um, as a joke, it was part of their yeah, it's part of their set. Yeah. So and then they sort of do mic drop, you know, having said. Uh, a statement that it, I can't, I can't broadcast. <laughs> you know, I've got to be very careful. You know, we're having to talk about allegations, but they're not bound by the same rules on a on a stage. And they were putting their head above the par the parapet because they wanted it known, they wanted it out there, and they were uncomfortable with that. And they were, this is male comedians and female comedians. They were uncomfortable with the fact that they felt their industry was covering up for a predator, an alleged predator. So this and, was their way of drawing attention to the story. Yeah, and I would, I would. I would say, you know, they were using the medium they had. Um, and, you know, some of them uh, were coming under pressure to stop doing that. So, um, you know, agents get very worried when, they're, when their clients start doing things that are difficult and controversial. So um, I, I would I would say this was, in one way, a way of being brave. You know, they were, they were trying to speak out. And just looking at that timeline, because mm. I interviewed Russell Brand in 2017, he just brought out this book on addiction. So he was doing the whole sort of self-flagellation or self-knowledge thing. But then he seemed to change mm. round about 2019. I mean, just at the point where you are then doing this investigation, you're just starting to work on this investigation. He pivots. 
right? He turns into a very different sort of being. He's not doing the BBC. He's not doing Channel 4. He's been, I think, fired or you know, shoved away from both those areas. And he's now kind of reinventing as a, a wellness guru. Do you think that that was a coincidence? Uh, I think that's for other people to decide what I would say. And Emily, you are one of the few people who actually asked him outright about his behaviour towards women in that interview. I mean, I think it actually got, got, got uh, that clip's gone round because you actually did ask him about this because so much of this is in the public domain. There is genuinely a passage in his book where he says, you know, what kind of man was I treating women in this way? And then he says... If this is what I'm admitting to, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly here, but if this is what I'm admitting to, imagine what I'm leaving out. And that was in his um, in his second set of memoirs. And that was published. So there's a definite hiding in plain sight thing here. But in terms of the pivot, it is interesting to me that I began this in 2019. And by 2020, you know, the anti-vaxxer stuff, all of that starts coming out. And there's a second element to this, which is that he wasn't getting those mainstream jobs anymore. So he wasn't appearing on Channel 4 um, sort of uh, comedy programmes. Although, I should note, he was appearing quite late on those shows because he went on um, Celebrity Bake Off right before this period and um, baked a vagina cake. And I mean, if that isn't making a mockery of things, I don't quite know what is. So he was still getting some work up until about that point, and then it all dried up. But to be clear, in terms of this potential pivot and whatever his motivations were for that, he, he knew that you were working on this story? I don't know that. And But one always assumes that they know, don't they? Because, the uh, I mean, you have to, as a journalist, assume that they're becoming aware of it, particularly as you get to people closer to someone, because you're going to reach out to someone who will tell him. You just know that. And I don't know exactly the exact moment that he became aware. But I should say, I wasn't the only journalist sniffing around this either. So the point, point being, you know, most of the main, you know, are, actually, can I even think of, I think almost every newspaper and every media outlet has tried to do this story at some point. But you and Charlotte got the women to talk and you were probably constantly aware that for every moment you get somebody to actually tell their story, you're also ratcheting up a potential lawsuit if you get anything wrong. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and that, you know, we have an obligation, obviously, to do everything in a way that... Well, one, if there was a lawsuit, we would be able to defend exactly what we've done. But also, you know, I'm I'm very aware that the Sunday Times and the Times, you know, they have very established, impressive, well, extraordinary reputations globally. And I don't want to be the idiot journalist who does some damage to that brilliant reputation. You know, I, I'm constantly aware of the legacy and history and obviously the same goes for Charlotte at the Times, that we cannot do something that would be damaging and, and that would be financially damaging for the company too. I mean, that's always a fear for people, isn't it? Did you think um, he'd come after you? You always have to have that possibility in your mind. Yes, absolutely. I mean, do you still think that now? We'll see. We'll see on that one. Um, I am very, very confident in our reporting. And actually, Charlotte was the game changer on that. So Charlotte um, Wace at the Times came on board on this uh, towards the start of this year. Um, so she's worked on it a shorter time. But in that time, she has been extraordinary. And she, what she was able to do was find a level of evidence with this one particular woman who we've called Nadia, that I have a level of evidence so strong. I've, I've never seen anything like that on a Me Too story. I've worked on a number of Me Too stories and Almost invariably, you're always scratching around saying, but the problem is we can't prove this. We will really struggle. Let's just play the clip of Nadia. and She was allegedly raped by Russell Brand in his apartment and there was a text exchange after that. Yeah, so this is back in July 2012 uh, and this allegation from the woman that they are calling Nadia um, and the text exchange goes like this. Brand texts, I'm sorry, that was crazy and selfish. I hope you can forgive me. I know that you're a lovely person. 
kiss. Nadia texts, you scared the shit out of me. You're right, I am a lovely person. For you to take advantage of me like this is unexpected. You have a problem, you need help. It's dangerous, you think you can get your own way all the time. Do you know how scary you are when that glazed look comes over you? When a girl says no, it means no. Do I have to go and get myself tested? Last time you asked me, condom or no condom? When I say condom, that doesn't mean it's optional. You don't have the best reputation. I pride myself on being safe and trying to make the right decisions. Obviously, this was a bad one. I'm so disappointed. And some time later, Rand replies, I'm very sorry. You don't need to get tested. I will make this up to you somehow with love, with love and kindness. Not my original idea, which was more sex. You've been lovely to me and I'm embarrassed by my behaviour. Sorry. Kiss. And then sometime later again, he texts, will you ever forgive me? And we should just say that the Sunday Times team and Channel 4 have been clear that they have verified that that was indeed Russell Brand's number. I mean, evidentially, that is profound, isn't it? I mean, as you say, Ros, I mean, actually, it's unusual to have that level of evidence in one of these cases. Absolutely, but I'd go further than that. She didn't just provide that. Uh, Charlotte, you know, has uh, has built a, rep- a relationship, obviously, you know, a professional relationship, but... but she has been able to persuade this woman to hand over medical notes. Um, you know, she went to the rape crisis centre the very next day. Um, so, you know, this body of evidence here is so profoundly strong. You know, photographs, um, so, so much evidence. Just on that, what's the latest you've heard, both from the LAPD, if you've heard anything at all, and the Metropolitan Police? Uh, so I think we're at a point where they're sort of saying women, if they want to come forward, but um, but I don't, but they they haven't opened an investigation. But but what about me. more women? Are they reaching out to you now? I mean, they know where to find you, and they know you're going to listen. I'm wondering if since publication, your inbox is now sort of filling up. It is, but we have to be very careful that. We were so extraordinarily rigorous in terms of the corroboration of these stories. You know, we had to do quite intrusive things and ask incredibly intrusive questions, actually. Um, And we have to make sure that we are meeting that same incredibly high standard of reporting because, as you've seen, there's plenty of people online who think this is some sort of mad conspiracy. And we have to prove that we have done everything right and that we continue to do everything right in our reporting. And obviously that's difficult and that will take time. So yes, we have had a lot of a lot of people come forward, but... Um, so what will you do with that? We've now got to go and corroborate their stories and meet them. And, and some of them won't may, may meet our bar. I mean, I, I should say not every person that we spoke to who made an allegation is in the paper because there is a very high bar to publication in in terms of you know providing evidence what you know what what we ask of people is is so is so much really did you have others who decided that you spoke to but who didn't want to go the whole through the whole process of yes giving their stories to the paper yes and i'm willing to say it because i think it's really important that we acknowledge that it is a difficult process for these women the idea that somebody would do this because i don't know they want attention or whatever i mean it it, it is an unpleasant process you have to be and obviously also we have to check that there's somebody who is credible and that's what i mean about intrusive questions you know asking somebody if they've got a criminal record that type of thing um and and then you know and obviously none, none of our women did I, I should add but you know also none of our women know each other because you can get cross contamination of sources so that's a further consideration and then additionally um you know you have to do this sort of level of corroboration text messages emails have they told their story to anyone you know dates times places dates times places and if something happened a long time ago, that's very, very difficult, yeah. You mentioned the reaction that there's been and some of the sort of conspiracy reaction online. I guess it's worth saying that for many people, the first thing they heard about this story was actually Russell Brand's own denial on that YouTube video that surfaced, what, Friday night, mm. Friday evening. Did that did that surprise you? Or did you kind of, did you guess that was coming? No, we gave him eight days to reply I mean in 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 the end because we got a response on Thursday um, uh, of last week and we had gone to him about a week before that um, and so he'd had actually 
a long time. I mean, it, you know, some people may say, well, that doesn't seem long enough to them. But if somebody came to me with allegations like that, I could immediately deny them because they wouldn't be true. Um, so he, we did get a legal response um, and our lawyers replied actually incredibly quickly. And then we heard nothing. And my brilliant colleague from the Times, Paul Morgan Bentley, um, was in charge of that because this is that's quite a terrifying. I, I think that's one of the most frightening bits is going to people for right reply as a journalist. Um, and he has done he did an exceptional job at managing it. But he continued to chase um, a response, and we didn't get one. And then we had discussed the possibility. This wasn't someone who's going to play by the usual rules uh, as we would see them. And we had discussed the fact that he might release a video. That did seem a logical thing to happen and to get on the front Not just release a video, but almost unleash his sort of bandwagon of conspiracy supporters immediately to dismiss anything as kind of mainstream media vendetta. But that is why we wanted to be so watertight in our reporting. And we wanted to be, and we, uh, we met that standard, but that's why we had to do everything you know, everything by the book, everything perfectly. Were you surprised by the extent of that, of that sort of conspiracy fueled reaction, even from some, not just the usual suspects, but some people who have television programs, some people who have, are, are more quote unquote mainstream? Uh, yeah, look, I find it a bit disappointing that there are journalists, um, it's always columnists, frankly, it's not, it's not reporters at other papers, columnists who were critiquing it without having read the story and I would point out some of those columnists were people who their own newspaper was running on the front page with all of our allegations all of our hard work you know all of Charlotte's hard work uh, and at the same time they got a columnist somewhere saying well you know have they done all the have they done all the work here you know it's just women saying it type thing and you think well hang on a minute look at look at our body of evidence here don't just but they hadn't no, 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 they no. Uh, one of them admitted to me she hadn't even read the piece. You talk about Alison Pearson here. I am, yeah, yeah. I'm willing to say that. And why do you think? I mean, what do you think's in it for them? Do you think attention? I've so I used to be a columnist. Look, I've had a very odd path as a journalist because I got a column far too young. I would now note, age sort of 24, 23, something like that. And you know, no one should have heard from me at 23 or 24. <laughs> bluntly, I had a column for eight years. Columnists always have columns too long, and I was one of them. And I made the decision to step away from it. And actually, it's really relevant to this story in my reasoning. My reasoning was me too. And if you look at when I left writing a column, it was shortly after me too. And the reason for that was I found it so disappointing that there were so many columnists who wrote about these things and were saying, oh, this is just a he said, she said story. And actually what had happened is, you know, these brilliant journalists, brilliant reporters had gone away, done all the hard work that incidentally I now know because I've just ha done it all um, on a really difficult story. And then it's just being as though, the, you know, as though it's sort of oh, it's just a woman saying something and they've just published it. That's not how it works in newspapers or, to, or on TV. You can't just publish something because someone's told it to you. So I was reminded that when the FT recently broke the story about Chris Benodi, yeah. the fund manager who um, they exposed in a, a, a very similar way, um, I'd said this is this is what happens actually when you have women in editorial positions now. Mm. And I would cite Rula Khalif at the FT yep. and Becky Barrow, who's been your um, news editor, Louisa Compton at Dispatches. I'd also say Esme Wren and Jess Brammer, who were really instrumental at Newsnight in just somehow making these stories a priority. Yeah. And I wonder if you think that that, that, that is why we, we will see more. This is a sort of natural consequence of having more women in more positions of power? I think it's even broader than that because we have a phenomenal legal team led by Pia, uh, Pia Sama. And, you know, I did, I, I, obviously she doesn't, she's not doing, you know, she's she's a lawyer first, you know, it's not, there's nothing. But I think having a woman in the legal side of this was also incredibly powerful. I, you know, she, we were, we couldn't have done this without her. And because I think lawyers, lawyers get help you get things over the yeah, line rather than stop you from they, doing They get too. forgotten a bit in how important they are in a story like this, but, you know, they're everything, actually. Um, and I would say as well, you know, we have a male editor um, at the Sunday Times, Ben Taylor, and, you know, it is about allies too. And, yeah. you know, he's hired a lot of brilliant women and uh, throughout his career, and he... He is somebody that I feel I would be able to talk to about these things, and he would understand. And I think that's important too. So it's not it's not just women, but of course it does absolutely help that we have. I mean, we have a, a female news desk at the 
the four four main people on the news desk, apart from our investigations editor, um, the the other four are, are women. So very female led um, place now, particularly on news where very often you know a lot of the reporters are still men. But they've been incredibly supportive, I should add. Um, I couldn't really have asked for better colleagues, actually. Yeah. How are you? How are you feeling about it now? Because it's weird. Anyone, you know, anyone who's worked on a story, um, usually not for as long, nearly as long as you have. But there is this kind of, there's a real process to it, right? An yeah. arc to it, a narrative to it. Um, and when you finally publish it and you wait for the reaction, it is a weird feeling, isn't it? How are you feeling about it now? Yeah, Where do you think the story is going? Also, the difficulty is you've been doing all this work to get stuff ready and then suddenly everyone else is on it too. Um, one thing I've been, has made this much easier is having Charlotte because she understands the exact same process that I've been through, Charlotte Wace. Um, because, you know, it is it is very difficult and it is very, it can be very emotionally draining. And I think for me, it's been really helpful having somebody else um, who's 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 experienced it. I, I, was, I was saying before that... Um, Films about journalism are always really anticlimactic because the culmination moment is, you know, you just sort of hit, you hit send and that's that. Um, but so there's a weird moment when I knew we were printing and, you know, it, was, it had all gone, the page is gone and then Charlotte and I just sort of sat there and it's like, I, I didn't really know what my emotion was. And, you know, you're very emotional and obviously you're very, you're still very worried for the women because it's a very hard thing to go through and particularly if they're going to read stuff online about them that is untrue. Um, that is very unpleasant. Do you want to see Russell Brand charged and convicted? It's not up to me to say that. You know, it's not... Um, it's an interesting question. And I think, you know, one of the criticisms that we get for doing stories like this is, oh, you should have handed this dossier over to the police. Well, one, I have no right to do that. If women tell me something, they are telling me. They are not telling the police. And I think it has to be a part of journalism that we always you know the fundamental rule of journalism is you protect your sources and you do you know and that is so fundamental there's sort of you know we have an industry where there aren't that many you know we're a bit more relaxed about certain other rules but fundamentally that is the one thing that if you fail at you have failed as a journalist and so it has to be their decision it's nothing to do with me frankly and you know maybe maybe we we shall see on that um but but there people have good reasons for not wanting to talk to the police i would add and particularly, you know, we've had so many stories. I mean, obviously, Wayne Cousins being the most extreme version of that, but plenty of other stories about why women wouldn't want to talk to the police and why they might instead think that journalism was a better way to get this out. Well, you've spent four years getting inside the head of this man to some extent. You know, you've read everything that he said. You've watched all his interviews. What do you think of him? This is a really good question because I've actually never met him. So in 2015, I think, I was asked to interview him when I was... Um, when I was a columnist at the Standard and did lots at the Evening Standard and did lots of interviews for them, and he was the only person I ever said no to interviewing, and I didn't know any of this. It wasn't that I had a particular, you know, I didn't have any knowledge of any of this then. I didn't, and and in fact, mo it, that it wasn't at a point where a huge number of people knew this. Um, it wasn't that sort of open secret level that there were these allegations against him. My reasoning was that I'd watched him on TV and I have a particular aversion to people who don't um, respect your personal space. I find it, it's a, a power play and I find it very unpleasant. And just always I could see in, in when clips of him and in interviews, he's always getting too close to uh, to people. And I have I just knew I didn't want to be around that. I find that a very, um, a very manipulative thing to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a journalist, you don't often say no to interviewing people. I mean, genuinely, I've never turned, I mean, unless I've got a conflict of interest or something. Uh, I haven't, there haven't been loads of people that I've been like I can't possibly you know I'm not picky um and um and so to, to for me to have felt that my colleague went and did it it was perfectly fine but um I just knew I didn't want to sit in a room with him Rosman that's fascinating thank you so much thank, thank you, you so much. now some people say we were in too much of a rush and it's certainly true that I didn't just try to fatten the pig on market day I tried to rear the pig fatten the pig and slaughter the pig on market day. I confess to that. But the reason we were in a rush is because voters had voted for change. Welcome back. So Liz Truss has been making a speech today to commemorate, if that is the right word, a year on from the self-imposed financial crisis that her government created. She was speaking to the Institute for Government in London about the importance of free market ideas and growth 
Got to say one thing for her. She's consistent. It's quite interesting that in this speech, she blames the political and economic reaction to her policies rather than the policies themselves. And I'm guessing that if the policies had been slightly more watertight, then the, dare I say, political and economic reaction wouldn't have been quite so disturbed. When we say economic reaction, we should just remind our listeners that the Bank of England actually had to step in to uphold the pension market because the whole thing was tanking. Now, where I think Liz Truss is on slightly firmer ground is where she she basically castigates the Bank of England for not raising interest rates slightly quicker. And I think whether you believe that or not, you can make an economic argument to say that they probably should have stepped in earlier to do that. And it would have kind of created a, a more stable you know, atmosphere in which she could then work. Does it stop her policies from being batshit crazy? It doesn't. And I think it's kind of worth noting that Mark Carney, who is the former governor of the Bank of England, who was speaking in Montreal um, over the weekend, has called her a lifelong politician masquerading as a free marketeer with little experience of the private sector. He's actually um, suggested that she created Argentina on the channel because she turned this country into a basket case with some of the things she was trying to implement. There's another interesting thing about Truss, right, which is that she says there, why were we in a hurry? And, and it's worth bearing in mind, she's never apologised for, for, for what happened. The only thing that she's apologised for is sort of getting some of the communication wrong um, and maybe moving a bit too quickly. She says that they were in a hurry because she only had two years, correct, but also that people voted for change. And they voted for change in 2016 and 2019. And I think this is the point that she has never really kind of internalised or addressed or her supporters. Yes, she's right. People did clearly vote for change in 2016 and 19 uh, in one form or another. It has never been clear. Indeed, if anything, it is extremely clear. They did not vote for the sort of libertarianism and free market approach, the kind of reheated 1980s agenda that Truss was espousing. The entire point of 2016 and 2019 was that it was a shift in conservative political thinking. It was a shift towards the state. It was a shift towards the sort of political demography and areas and seats that were not comfortable with the so-called Singapore on Teng model that Mark Carney was referring to. And the problem Actually, for... Actually, Singapore works, can well, I just so, yeah, point out. Yeah, but, Argentina was the basket case. Yeah, but the, that was the 2000 crash, whereas sure. Singapore is meant to be the model of low taxation that does work. I think that is... <laughs> yeah, it might work, a, but the point is... The, it may well work, but the point is... Or it works, might work for Singapore, although they actually have quite a big state. But anyway, the point is, is that that was never... There was never a mandate for that. There was never any kind of mandate from the public. There was a mandate perhaps from Conservative Party members, all 100,000 of them or so. There was never going to be, or there was never a political mandate or appetite for, a shift from Johnsonism. Because Johnson, to his credit, kind of intuited correctly that there had been this shift in Conservative thinking and the, the sort of people who were voting Conservative. But there was never a mandate to shift from that to a kind of reheated libertarianism, the sort of which that Trust believes in. And she should therefore have expected that there would be political counter-reaction to it, as well as economic counter-reaction, given that she is the one who is supposed to understand the markets. And as we discussed many times at say, the time, the idea that the international markets were some form of kind of, you know, establishment, left-wing establishment, Trojan horse, was always just complete nonsense. Look, put that in context. There was never a mandate for Theresa May, who inherited from David Cameron. But there, there was, was never... in a sense, because she was taking the Brexit mandate. And then she tried to seek one for herself in 2017 and it didn't work. Yeah, but that's that's what I'm saying. She didn't get a mandate from the British people as their Prime Minister. Liz Truss didn't get a mandate from the British people as their Prime Minister. Rishi Sunak didn't get a mandate from the British people as their Prime Minister. This is surely part of the problem, isn't it? That we have now had five Conservative Prime Ministers, only two of which have been voted into power by the country. And this is what happens. You start trying to talk about change. Who are you trying to change from? The last guy that was voted in, the guy that's going to come afterwards that won't be voted in, you know, you don't actually know who you're trying to differentiate yourself from anymore because it's all your own party. And I just want to say on this one issue, she's only had a 47 day stint in office and over the weekend, Labour have appealed to Rishi Sunak to block any potential honours list. I say potential. They think she's got 14 honours to give out, which is about what, one every three and a half days. Um, not bad going. At most. And, and the 
and the pressure now is on Rishi Sunak, who has to decide whether he obeys convention or whether he goes, you're right, this is just another batshit crazy Liz Truss thing. Can I also link these two stories that we'll be talking about today? And and people might not expect me to say that, and it is in a slightly sort of oblique way, but I think it is important. One of Truss's... The thing that Truss has started to extol and talk about all the time is something that has become more and more common on the mainstream kind of centre-right and within centre-right politics um, in recent years. It is this idea, which used to find more on the old sort of left of politics, this idea that there is conspiracy everywhere, that there is deep state, that there are forces, particularly in the mainstream media, we remember how often Truss attacked the so-called mainstream media and the BBC and elsewhere repeatedly during the election campaign that there is a kind of left-wing cabal, an agenda that is always conspiring to undo what the people really want, that the mainstream media, all of these sort of things, they don't represent the public, basically that they're lying to you. Well, that is the agenda of brand. That is exactly the kind of forces that he taps into and has tapped into over the course of this weekend. And this is why mainstream politicians of every stripe have to be really careful about their language. And this, this indulgence of these kind of conspiracy-minded ideas that have become more and more common in politics, and as I say, particularly common on the right of politics in recent years, are really, really dangerous because it legitimises them. When you've got someone like Liz Truss standing up, you know, who's prime minister of this country, she's foreign secretary of this country, she's trade secretary of this country, she's been in politics for a long time, basically saying that there are all of these forces within society that are constantly trying to conspire against me and our ideas and against the public and so on. It is a dangerous set of ideas. And although power, yeah, we always got to be uh, we've always got to have a lot of scrutiny about power and as journalists we've always got to make sure that we're scrutinising power properly and be slightly suspicious of power this idea constantly that conspiracy becoming such a central part of our politics and culture it's not only depressing it's dangerous Lewis it's called populism it's how it works you set up an elite who don't understand you and the people and whether it's Russell Brand saying the elite is the mainstream media but you know my lovely followers on YouTube the wellness guru people will all believe in me and follow me or whether it's Liz Truss saying it's the people who live in London town has or do podcasts or have dinner parties or you know the media the political elite whatever it's a way of saying you want to take away the institutions. You want to take away, if you like, the standard bearers and the gatekeepers of our institutions because you, the populist, just want to speak directly to the people. And of course that's a trick. We, we've, we've seen that time and time again. And you're right, if you're not kind of conscious of how it's working, how it's operating, then everyone starts checking themselves out for the conspiracy, right? That's, that's how it's happened. It's only Monday. <laughs> Roll on Tuesday. Can't wait. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 